All right, everybody. I'm going to begin today's clinic with a spicy hot take. This is not music. This is instructions. It'd be like calling, like to call sheet music music is sort of like calling a recipe food. You know, it's not, it's not a game, it's code. It's not a movie, it's a screenplay. It's not music, it's instructions on how to play music. That's what this is. That's what these pieces of paper that we're all familiar with really are. They're just instructions. And just like how, you know, a recipe can have a typo, um, a video game can have a glitch, there's a problem with the code, and a movie can have a line where a character is suddenly talking about sand. You know, there can be issues with uh, the instructions on how to make art. In fact, uh, these errors are so common, there's a term for it, errata, E-R-R-A-T-A. -R We're familiar with that. We know that there can be mistakes. We all understand this. So if we understand that there can be mistakes, surely we can understand that there's some important information, very pertinent to the way that we play our instruments, that's not on the page. That's what today's clinic is called, What Isn't on the Page. So, everybody has a pencil? Mm -hmm. Good. This is going to be, I highly recommend you write stuff down, because the packets that you have have absolutely no markings on them. You, know, you might want to take notes, maybe you'll write stuff in the music if you like what you hear. Um, but it is completely yours to mark on, those are yours to keep, do as you please with that. So first of all, I'm going to ask the first year students first, does anyone recognize that first passage of music? No? Any second years? Any third years? Fourth years, graduates? Everything on the first page? What is the first page? Uh, the second part is... Uh... Suite, it's both the first suite and E flat. Oh. All of it is first. <clears throat> yes. So that's good. And it's okay if you don't know it. It's just a small section. But the reason I picked this piece as a first example is because this is probably a piece that most of you should be or probably already are familiar with. It's one of the most commonly played wind band pieces. Symphonic bands all across the country and even all over the world play this piece, right? So familiarity should be, you know, ideal there. So the thing about uh, First Suite in E-flat is that it's one of the first wind band pieces ever written, and as such, the use of percussion in a large ensemble was relatively brand new. So a lot of the info that we have now, we just kind of take for granted, was not present in a piece written hundreds of years ago, right? So if you take a look at the first passage, you see one before B, you've got a cymbal crash. That's all it says. So if you were to play this at face value, it would sound something like this. You stand, you wait, rest, 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 here it comes. That's it. You played what was on the page. So what? Well, there's more to it than that. There's a whole lot more going on in the ensemble than what you just did. What you just did was one tiny little flash on top of what was happening. So here's a question for you. It says symbol. What kind of symbol? I'm asking you, what kind of symbol? I don't know, it doesn't say here. Doesn't say, okay, well if you had to make a guess. I would assume crash symbol. Assume crash, why would you assume crash? Uh, well, for one, the uh, fortissimo, that's just something they do. So a suspended symbol can't be loud? I think a suspended symbol can be loud, but I think that um, this, the way it's expressing it, I feel like it wants you to like just really hit it. It's a different kind of loud. Yeah. Right. So, yes? I think it's crash symbol because we don't want the suspended symbol to hurt. Okay. That's a smart aleck answer. <laughs> but that is correct. Yes. Well, looking at it at face value, you said symbol. It doesn't indicate whether or not it's crash or suspended. Correct. But the thing is, when you play this piece, you're already making a kind of flash assumption. You're already thinking about, you know, kind of like what Cree just did, what is happening in the piece, you know, what would be more appropriate right now for this point in the music. So, anyone who's familiar with this piece, what is happening in this music right now? There's a build up and there's a running of the drums that's leading up to B. There's a crescendo. There's a crescendo, exactly. What you're doing here is you're, you know, you're highlighting the climax, right? There's this big group 
crescendo up to this high point and the symbol is that top. And it just says symbol, so you can very well, you know, highlight this climax with the suspended symbol, but the crash symbols have a different sound than a suspended symbol. You know, a crash, a suspended symbol could be, could be loud, it could be bombastic, it could be soft, it could be more lush. But whereas with crash symbols, you've got two plates clanging together. So there's an inherent, there's an inherently climactic aspect to these instruments. So based on what you know about the piece, you are making the decision to use crash symbols when it just says symbol. So when you think about what isn't on the page, rule number one, maybe rule number zero is listen. Listen. What is happening in the music right now? What are you playing compared to what else is going on? If you really listen, that will allow you to fill in the gaps of what isn't on the page. But even the stuff that isn't on the page is still not complete. You know, as was pointed out, there's a group crescendo. There's this, you know, this is very continuation to this very high point. Triple forte, crash symbol, that's it. What happens after that? Does anybody know? Yes. Like, I've never listened to this piece, so I'm assuming it like either just drops down or it drops down. It drops down. It does. Okay, no big deal. You've got this big crash. Whatever, it's suddenly quiet after that. But it's not just a crash. What else is there? Sustained. There's a tie. It's sustained. That crash lasts over into the quiet section. Sounds a little weird, right? I mean, you, you hit this big, you know, moment, and then all of a sudden it stops. But it's not staccato. It doesn't, doesn't choke. There's no indication of the music that that is what it is. You can assume it's a mistake, or you can really think about why it's there. Why is there a sustain? Does Holst want there to be a sort of resonance? And if so, how do you do that appropriately? It's times like this where you might want to think outside of the box. We're making the assumption that it's crash symbols. It's a good assumption to make. We know it gets loud, and we know that right after that, the bottom drops out. So how do you show that with this? Here's a suggestion. When you get to that moment, you may strike and then mute one of them. So you've still got a little bit of resonance, but it's not quite the triple forte that is written in the piece, right? Now, nowhere on the page does it say to do that, but based on listening, based on knowing what is in the piece, you can, you can add character to the piece that wasn't there. By thinking about what is there and what instructions you're given, you can make an informed decision on how to make it even better, right? Rule number zero, listen, what's going on? What can you do to enhance that? And just general familiarity with the piece is gonna help. I mean, how many of us, when we're given music for wind ensemble, symphonic band, or orchestra, we don't even listen to the piece, we just go into the first rehearsal and try to read it down. Be honest, how many of us do that? <laughs> I should see most hands. And that's, you know what, that just kind of happens. We don't really think about the music we play, we just sort of look at the music and we just play it. But knowing the piece ahead of time can help you make decisions like this. So that's just the first statement. If you look at the next couple statements of the piece, as you can see, we've got uh, if you look at F, Listesso Tempo, you've got triangle on the top, tambourine on the bottom. Once again, you can take these passages at face value. If you look at the fifth bar, second bar from the end of the top line, you've got the triangle, it's piano, it just tells you three eighth notes, so there you go. That's all it is. But what's happening in the music right there? I think it's like what flutes or something. Da, da, da. Right, that it's that pattern. Da, da, da. That's not short though. That's yeah. sort of like a sustain at the end. Mm -hmm. And knowing that can maybe inspire a little bit of creativity with it. So maybe just instead of going like mute just like that, you might try to match what the winds are doing. So if they're going da, 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 you might play and let it ring a little longer to highlight what it's doing. Because the triangle isn't playing on its own. It's shimmering on top of a wind instrument. You're adding to it, and you're making an informed decision to make it a little more special, right? What about the tambourine? What's that doing? 
matching instruments as well. So. Matching the clarinet part. Matching the clarinet. Sing it for me. Right, listen to that. Da, 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 da. It's just four notes. But then it goes. Da, 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 da. There's a little bit of a jump there. So maybe when you play it, you might want to play it like. With a little bit of a lilt at the end, right? Yes, this is how I play this excerpt. <laughs> you don't have to play it this way, but this is the way I'm most comfortable. And of course, there is stuff on the page. Pianissimo, you don't want it too loud. I didn't play that very well that time, but you get it? So you still want it in the ballpark of pianissimo, but who's to say you can add a little more magic to it? You know, really highlight what else is going on. Add a little bit more creativity to it. You know, be a musician. You've got the part, this is what Holst wants. This is presumably what the maestro wants. So who's to say that you can't add a little more character to it, really highlight what these parts are doing, and doing so by knowing what the piece is doing. By, by knowing what is going on around you, listening to your surroundings, and adding to it. If you get so zeroed in on the page, you're only going to be focusing on what's there. You're not thinking at all about what the flutes are doing, what the trumpets are doing, what the conductor is doing, what the resonance in the hall is. If you think about all that stuff, you can take standard pianissimo part and make it special. makes all the difference. That's just one piece of music. We've learned that from listening. But there's so much more you can do besides just listening to help you understand music a little better. When you learn orchestral excerpts, as I'm sure many of you will do or have done, be honest, again, and I'll raise my hand too, how many of you have gone into a lesson or gone into an audition just looking at the piece of music and playing it down as written. Probably most of us. Yeah, that's the issue that we run into. Because the point of doing orchestral aud uh, auditions is that we're familiar with the repertoire. We know what it's all about. We know how it goes. We know what's going on around us. So listening is one thing. But the second thing you can do to go beyond what is on the page is score study. And that, just, that doesn't just mean knowing what the other instruments are doing, it goes a little bit of a step further. What is the piece about? What is it titled? What is the background of it? What is, what is going on? On that note, any first years know what this next excerpt is from? Second year? Any third years? Well, when you say background, uh, uh, what is happening with the other musicians? Or yeah, well, what is, or what, is the <laughs> what is the title of the piece? What is it about? Scheherazade. Yes, Scheherazade. That's what this is. Oh, okay. This is an extremely famous snare drum excerpt, right? So, what is Scheherazade about? Does anyone know? I know the specific movement is about Scheherazade. Okay, that's good. But a little more broadly, what is what is Scheherazade? Scheherazade was a queen that was forced into marriage to a king. Who, after their first night of consummating the marriages, he had them mur executed. Yes. And so she is telling him stories to prolong the execution because they haven't consummated. Yes. It's called the Thousand and One Nights, or also Arabian Nights. If you're familiar with the stories of Aladdin or Sinbad the Sailor, that comes from the Arabian Nights. So the background of this piece is very fantastical. It's folklore, right? It's, a, it's got a kind of... A, uh, high energy to it. And as Mario pointed out, you know, this movement is evocative of a shipwreck, but it's also evocative of an Arabian festival. So, the general tone of this excerpt is bombastic. It's exciting. So that alone will tell you that this excerpt is not quiet. Obviously it says forte, but more so, it's very dynamic. It's very exciting. It's a party. Possibly a shipwreck. Rimsky-Korsakov himself you know, admits that his writing isn't totally literal and that the movements in the piece are not meant to represent certain events. They're just sort of inspired by that. But again, this is all stuff you would know if you do score study. If you know what the piece is about, you know what they're generally trying to evoke, that can really help your interpretation of what is on the page. So thinking about that, thinking about shipwreck, party, that tells you a lot in bombastic. 
But more specifically, if you know what else is going on in the piece, you would know that these roughs and the 32nd notes are highlighting what the rest of the orchestra is doing. These are orchestral hits. You're highlighting what they're doing. Just like the crash cymbal in the first suite, you're highlighting what the rest of the orchestra is doing. So with that, you see the roughs? It wouldn't really make sense to have them open. You'd want them as closed as possible. Because this is a orchestral hit. It's a big moment, right? And these moments are on the back beats, except for the 32nd notes, where the hit is on the, the front beat. We have kind of a ja, 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 da 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 da. So when you play this piece, think about it that way. Fair enough. But there's something else missing. At this point in the piece, you have the roughs on beat one and two. There's a crescendo up and a crescendo down happening in the orchestra that is not written on the page. Which is bizarre because it's written in the other parts. It's written in the score. For some reason, it's not in the snare part. But it's important because the entire orchestra is doing it. And there seems to be no reason why the snare drum would be doing those eighth notes at forte the whole time when nobody else is. So with that in mind, you look at what the orchestra is doing, and it's a two measure up, one measure down pattern. So crescendos for two measures, diminuendos for one measure, and then the 30, 30 second notes are as before, the accent is on the front. So when you play it, it sounds more like this. And so on. That's all fine and good. Move on to Q. You've got this extremely fast pattern that some have debated on what's the best way to play it. Best to play it as diddles or as single strokes. I prefer to play it as single strokes. But you look at what's on the page, you got mezzo forte, it's not too much. But what else is going on right there? Does anybody know? Yeah, trumpets. Trumpets! They have to tongue all those notes. Mm -hmm. So when you play this, don't go this fast. Because that means when you get to Q, if there's a trumpet player on that fat, on that jury, they're going to hate your guts. They're going to be like, you expect us to play that fast? So just knowing what's going on and what the other instruments have to do right there can also help massively when learning these excerpts. Not just knowing what the piece is about or what's going on, but what other instruments have to do. All of this stuff, you know, plays into consideration. So that's the score study aspect of what isn't on the page. There's one final aspect to what isn't on the page that I think is good to remember, and that is the art of performance practice. This last little bit that you've got in your packets on this page, any guesses as to what that is? Uh, it uh, handles Messiah. Hallelujah Chorus! Everybody knows this. So, with what we know, you know how it goes. Hallelujah, da-da-da-da, da-da-da, da-da. We've already talked about that. Knowing what's going on in the piece, there's that kind of accent pattern going on. But there's a general performance practice of this time period that isn't on the page. This piece was written during, between the Baroque and the Classical, late Baroque, early Classical. This is the time in music history when composers are really focusing on the contrast between the tonic and the dominant, the one and the five. In this case, D and A. And at this time, if you were playing a timpani part, you would highlight the dominant. You would accent that more, you would lean more into that. So if you were to start um, at the very beginning of this excerpt, keeping in mind the accent pattern, hallelujah, da da da, it would sound like this. And so on and so on. You want to really highlight that A. But as you move to the end, the last three measures, or the last two measures, you have this. Sounds a little dull.
small, doesn't it? Sounds a little too open. Another aspect of performance practice is at this point in the piece, historically, timpanists have improvised. They've added a pattern while the rest of the orchestra is just hanging on that, that subdominant chord. Ale, just going on like that. And you can just leave it there, or you can add a little something to it. Also, there's no role written. But again, performance practice. Understanding the piece, understanding the history, knowing generally what you're supposed to do with parts like this goes a long way. All of these things aren't on the page. None of that is set in stone. It's all stuff that you either have to listen for, do score study for, or learn about the history of performing this piece or performing music in general. There are so many aspects of performance that aren't written out for you. And the thing is, that's not just all you need to know. What's on the page, what you're doing, because there are so many things that affect the sound that you're doing. What kind of mallets you might be using, you know, are you, do you have a towel on your stand or are you just, you know, <coughs> slamming your sticks down? Are you turning the snares on too loudly? Are you shuffling around too much? You know, are, did your phone go off? There are so many things that could change the sound. And not just that, but the hall in which you're in. Now this room is very dead, you know, the, there's not a whole lot of resonance, you know, it's all padded up, but if you're in Harris, you know, if you're outside, all that stuff matters. So listening is not just a, you know, this is what I hear. What do people in the balcony hear? They're gonna hear what you do so differently from what you're doing. You might hear a lot of wash when you hit the timpani, but somebody back there, they'll just hear one note, you know, provided your stroke type is good and you've tuned correctly, but they, they hear it differently than you would, especially on instruments like marimba or crash cymbals. The way sound reverberates, the way it goes around, it's different, right? Evelyn Glennie did a great talk about what it means to truly listen, and the way she described it was, you know, you think about listening as it's strictly with your ears, but you use so much more. You also hear it in, in the rest of your head. You feel it in your arms when you play. You feel your body vibrate during the loud sections. You know, you can feel it in your feet when it vibrates on the ground. The chills you get from great music, you know, that's all, that's all a part of listening. This is all stuff you've got to think about. So that's what we're doing when we play in large ensembles. Imagine for a second that the concert's over, you played in your large group, whatever, it went great. Now it's just you by yourself. You're in a practice room, maybe you're lucky enough to be in a resonant hall, just you and your instruments. Is everything on the page at this point? You know, you're playing solos now. It's all stuff just for you, so there couldn't be possibly any mistakes, anything left out, right? Oh, there's so much. There's so much you have to take into account when you play solo works. Think about what we said before. Listen, score study, performance practice. This is especially helpful if you're playing a piece of music that maybe isn't written for your instruments. As you can see on this next page, we've got uh, the first part of the cello suite number five by Johann Sebastian Bach. I think Bach is awesome, and I think probably at some point in everybody's career they should play a piece by Bach. Now let me say this, I do not say this because Bach is one of the greatest composers of all time. If you know me, you know I don't care about legacy. I truly don't. You know, if something was written hundreds of years ago, it is not automatically great. There's a lot of music that was written during that time that is forgotten about. There's a lot of music that is remembered, but maybe it's not that special, maybe it just doesn't, you know, legacy, legacy is whatever. I like Bach because it's versatile, because it encourages creativity, it encourages expression, and it's subversive. Does anyone know what subversive means? No? Okay. I just have an idea. Sure. Like, where you 
kind of anticipate one thing and then you get into it and maybe it's different than what you anticipated? Yes, you're prepared to expect something and then something different happens. Your expectations are proven incorrect. Great art uses subversion all the time. Scary movies use subversion. They lull you into a false sense of security and suddenly there's the killer. Comedy uses subversion. It makes you think that something's gonna happen. Most jokes are an example of subversion. Like there's a joke that goes, you know what's really ironic? My, my grandmother was a cancer and she died by being eaten by a giant crab. <laughs> Different kind of cancer, right? Subversion. That's what so much of you know, great art has. It's all these moments where you think something's gonna happen and then this happens. Bach is full of that. What's the piece by Bach that everybody knows? Halloween's over, but it's the Toccata and Fugue, right? Everybody knows that one. It goes like this. He's just doing the same thing over and over again. But then he does this. <laughs> That's a major chord! I thought this was in minor. Subversion all the time. So, when you think about Bach, think about these subversive elements. This all comes from knowing about the composer's works and generally how he writes. So what I'm going to do for you now is I'm going to play this passage of music and I don't want you to look at the music. I want you to look at the score. I just want you to put that down and listen. Listen to the music and listen to all the moments when you think something is gonna happen and then you get subverted. Listen for all those moments. Did you notice we ended in a different key? I shouldn't say that. The key changed constantly. There were so many different resolutions to different tonal centers. This happens constantly in box music, especially in this cello suite. So, let's go back a little bit. When I talked about playing in a large ensemble setting, I mentioned three things. Listening, score study, and performance practice. The listen, I just talked about it. It's subversion. Listen for all the moments where Bach does something screwy. It starts off normal, C minor, that makes sense. Got a little run here. What's that? Sounds like a F minor, but there's a B natural in there. So when you get to that point, maybe slow down a little bit. Let it sit there. Let the strangeness kind of speak slowly continue on when you get back to the normal. Okay, this is all fine and good. Ooh, that's dissonant. Ooh, that's really dissonant. Okay, we're in F minor now, I guess. 
this? Bach, what are you doing? You see, that's what you have to do. You have to listen for all those moments. All those moments that come off as a little strange. And you have to make the decision if you're just going to play right through it and just let it be that way, or you're going to sit on it and you're going to highlight it. And then the question becomes, do you want it to be loud? Do you want it to be soft? Almost like it's a whisper that Bach doesn't quite want you to know what's going on, so it kind of sneaks its way in. That's the listening aspect. For the score study aspect, well, you have to understand what this is. It's a cello suite, and a suite is generally comprised of dances. The title of this movement is not a dance. It's prelude. If this movement was titled Courant or Sarabande or uh, um, Jig, you might have an idea of what to do based on what those dances are. But a prelude is deliberately ambiguous. So the tempo, uh, the general feel of it, can really be a lot of things. So it's up to you, the performer, to interpret that. You know, And the way I hear it when I play these notes is I feel this as kind of open, it's kind of ambiguous, it's kind of vague, it's kind of all over the place. So maybe you want to highlight those moments. You want to let the, the stillness and the vagueness ring out. That's what to think about. So that's the score study aspect of it. Then there's performance practice. This, mind-blowing fact, is not a cello. It is not a cello. It is, it is similar to a cello in the sense that we've got that low C which is precisely why cello suites work great on marimba. But the fact is, these are different instruments, and the way that a cello player may play this piece is just inherently going to be different from the way we play this piece. For one thing, the long tones. We don't really have that. We have sort of artificial long tones by way of roll. So when you look at these long tones in the piece, you have to ask yourself, do I want to make this just resonate on its own, or do I want to create a resonance? That's the best way to go about this. I personally am of the opinion that for this particular prelude, for this particular piece of music, it's best to let ring, because I want the sparse sound, I want the, the weirdness, I want the sort of sporadic, these individual moments happening to really be highlighted. So I like to let it ring. That's my reasoning, anyway. Another thing you have to think about is there are so many four-note chords, and the way a cello would play that is play the bottom two notes and then the top two notes. You see them. They go like that and then that. But, as a marimba player, we have other options. We could potentially use four mallets and just erase the need for that entirely. something that sounds a little more authentic, a little more like a cello suite. Some people arpeggiate. And again, I think that those practices maybe work for other versions of the, for other cello suites, maybe other pieces. But in this particular instinct, uh, instance, I like the sound of combining double stops because it adds to the atmosphere that I hear. And lastly, performance practice of trills. In these cello suites, it's customary to begin the trill with the higher note. If you look at measure nine, the trill between E flat and F starts on the F. So I like to play all the trills as follows, with an exception, and that's the final measure. I like to begin on the F sharp. Because that's the note that you're supposed to hear, right? So as you can see, what I'm doing here is I'm kind of towing the line between authenticity and making it its own thing. Because, you know, it's a cello suite. Maybe you want to play it as accurately as possible. That's this side of the spectrum. Or maybe you just want to take into account the fact that it's a marimba. It's not going to sound like a cello as hard as we try. That's this side of the spectrum. But you don't have to pick a side. It's more likely that you're going to be somewhere in here however far to the left or to the right 
the left or to the right that you want. You have to make these decisions. How much authenticity am I going for? Am I trying to emulate the sound of the cello as much as possible, or am I just gonna try to make it, make it my own thing? And again, none of that's on the page. There's no dynamics, no tempo marking, no nothing. You have to do all this work on your own. But that's what being a musician is all about. Anyone can play a note written on the page. It takes truly great musicians to listen, interpret what they hear, and make it into something that is uniquely their own. The space that you're in is a flash in the pan moment. Make it yours. Make it special. Do something with it. So with all that information, why don't we try a little group project now? We turn to the final page. I have done an arrangement of there, will be an, of there Will Never Be Another You, which is a famous jazz standard. I've written it as a vibraphone ballad. And I'm going to ask your opinion on what I should do. So, for starters, I'll play this as flatly as possible. We've got this kind of running pattern that just sort of outlines the harmony. Explain what you mean. Like, keep it, keep it all a little bit open, like with the piano, right? Keep it almost the piano for the first two bars, and then maybe the like, next two, maybe the triplets, the D bar as well. Like, okay. Pretty much oh. shoot deep down the A minor. Okay, what's your suggestion? It almost had a natural, like, accent on every downbeat. Okay. It's like a slight bit to bring it down when you were playing it. And I think that sounds just very nice, but I think you could either exaggerate that a little more, make it a more dramatic, like, ba -da 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 -da, Oh, like have, have accents and then kind of gradually go down? Mm -mm, like every downbeat is going to be accented, decrescendo, each 16th note down. Okay, you had an idea. Me? Yeah. Okay, so I see your little, um, Tenuto marking. marking. Yes, yes. So since you have free league rubato there too, maybe like you have just a little bit of like weight on those notes coming up. Weight on the notes. And like a little crescendo, like a little mini crescendo with that, like like but within like the soft thing, stay in soft okay. land, but have like a little. So when you say crescendo, do you think where should that be leading to? Like B. Huh? Like B, like maybe to the next chord string. Mm -hmm. Because there's like you're sitting on a chord and then you're moving up to another one. So at the beginning of measure two, that should have kind of a little weight to it. So what you're saying is. Well, maybe yeah. not that much, but like you could say like nice and. Okay, subtle. Maybe yeah. like mezzo, not mezzo piano, not mezzo forte, but mezzo, maybe? That's a dynamic. It can be. <laughs> I decided it is. What about tempo? Yeah. Is that good tempo? Anyone have any ideas on tempo? I was just going to say that the game uh, can be a little more loose, it seems like. What do you mean loose? That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can you somewhat build off of it? With it being a rubato section, you have to be playing a little slow. And then as it progresses, getting a little faster, and then you can slowly turn it down and just feel it out a little more. Slow down. Okay, so like gradually speed up, but when we get to the last part of it, slow down? Mm -hmm. In center tones. Yes. Yeah, I'm I'm in that boat. I'm saying those first two measures playing with more movement, kind of almost speeding up a little bit, getting into and then like measure three and measure four, kind of pulling it back and slowing it back down, and especially as you go into the fermata. Okay. I think I think like when you had it, like when you started playing it, it was a good tempo, but I think getting for bar for like measure one and two near the beats of three and four you should like slow down just a little bit to be more like to express it more and then you should then uh as the ending of bar four that's when you should really slow it down with, because of that tenuto mark okay i'm gonna try taking all that into consideration 
if I can. <laughs> I'll try something new. Tell me what you guys think. Sounds like there will be a light. Like never be breathing. Breathing. There you go. Oh, well, that's good. That's good. <laughs> so, after that, we have a little bit of a pre intro before we actually get to the main melody. What about that? Dynamic tempo, any ideas? You want glissandos? Yes. <laughs> Where? What? No, not glissandos. Sorry, sorry. Um, <laughs> okay, I was about to say. <laughs> sorry, sorry. It's okay. It's I'm a squiggly sorry. line. I didn't mean to publicly shame you. You mean trills? Oh, oh, trills. Yeah. Oh, oh, I don't know. I'll stick to what what notes are on the page. Oh, yeah. I think. I think that's, that's what he's trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. I think he's talking about a ripple. Yeah, he's just, yeah, that's exactly he's thinking about a ripple. Oh, a ripple. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, you mean? Yeah. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, that's good. So, uh, all right. So, so real, real quickly, let's play through this with those ideas. time so let's quickly talk about this is the point where we get to the head this is the melody that most jazzers are familiar with as a general vibe how should we think about vibe how should we think about the melody line any ideas it's the part that should be sticking out rather than the actual head okay focus a little more on that dynamically about the same mezzo piano, or should it be mezzo forte now? I think mezzo forte. Mezzo forte, okay, a little more. Should it kind of have this havering? Are there any high points you see just by looking at it? Yeah, I'd say maybe like a 10. Like a 10? Maybe like half a 10. <laughs> Measure numbers are right there. 10. Yeah, 10. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, let's just Whenever take. Yeah. yeah. So with all that you've suggested, let's try playing through this by keeping in mind line, dynamic, expression, listening to the piece, listening for the subversions, score study, maybe understanding where this piece came from, performance practice, stuff like pedaling and muting the notes. This is what it would sound like. Right there. So, 
one final thought before we, before we conclude here. Beginning of this clinic, I mentioned how sheet music is like a recipe. It's a sound recipe. So when you think about it that way, what do the best chefs do? They add their own spices. Maybe they change in, in ingredients. Maybe they add a little more flour, maybe a little less flour. They, ch they use the instructions and they edit it to make it truly great. Being a musician is just like that. You are taking your instructions, your sound recipe, and adding to it. You listen to it. You learn about the music. You learn about the history of music, performance practice, how to really make it your own. Being a musician is not reading black ink on a page. Being a musician is being an artist. Thank you.